All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your afternoon health and nutrition talk with Lalit M. Kapoor. Um, I'm Jade. I'm the community manager at Kids and Art Foundation. If you're new to us, uh, we're a Bay Area nonprofit where we provide uh, creative, memorable experiences for families touched by pediatric cancer. So this whole event is around um, art, health, and innovation, different ways of thinking about creative healing. Um, I would like to bring um, to stage um, Yishka, who has been um, a summer intern, and she will give it. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you all are having a great afternoon if you're on the West Coast and if you're on the East Coast. I hope you guys are having a great evening. Kids in Art is a cause that is very close to my heart, and I feel so privileged to bring this session to all of you. A very warm welcome to our guest, Mr. Lalith Kapoor, who has positively impacted thousands of lives, including those of my family members. Mr. Kapoor, an engineer from India's most premier institute, IIT Kanpur, moved to the US in 1973 to pursue his MBA from UCLA. After a very successful professional stint, Mr. Lalith Kapoor sold the many successful IT companies he had started to publicly traded traded companies and proceeded to retire in 2005. Since then, he has been very passionately pursuing health and nutrition. About eight years ago, he watched the documentary, Forks Over Knives, that resonated and, and motivated him to change his diet and lifestyle by following the advice of a group of doctors who recommend a whole foods plant-based diet. He lost 50 pounds and got off five different medications within 18 months including those for diabetes, hypertension, hyperthyroid, gout, and sleep apnea. He then went on to incorporate the latest developments in the field of intermittent and prolonged fasting into his lifestyle. Um, Mr. Lalith Kapoor has completely transformed our entire family's lives and the lives of thousands. And I'm so excited that he's here to present to all of you today he has been coaching others of how to take charge of their health and to get off medications for chronic diseases. So tune in and hear Mr. Lalith Kapoor bust health and nutrition myths. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to type in your questions and comments into the chat box. I present to you, Mr. Lalith Kapoor. Thank you, Nishka. And welcome everybody. I can't see anybody's face, but I'm sure you are there. So when I, when I changed my lifestyle and died eight years ago, many uh, good things happened. And Nushka mentioned that I lost 50 pounds and got rid of all my medications. So there group, there's a group of doctors in, in America who are beginning to realize that somewhere in the last couple of decades, we have failed as a society. We did very well when we were fighting infectious diseases. We developed antibiotics, which did wonders. And uh, at the time, our main enemy was infectious diseases and antibiotics. You, you take a pill for three days or five days and the disease is gone. As a result, we have developed a psyche that when you are ill, take a pill and you should be okay. Unfortunately, there are diseases which are more related to our diet and lifestyle. And when we take a pill, those diseases don't get cured. You go see a doctor, the doctor says, you'll have to take this medication for the rest of your life. That's how Around age 45, 50, you start with hypertension. Then uh, another few years, you get on diabetes pills. Another few years, by the time you're 50, 52, you have a cholesterol problem. So you start taking a statin drug. And it keeps on going. So. Um, you know, there are two observations to be made. One is if you look around, 
in the wildlife and you look at the animal kingdom, there are no hospitals there, there are no doctors, and they're doing fine. They, they're living their life. Yes, they, they're scared of predators and they have to watch for them. But besides that, they live a normal, healthy life and uh, die when the time comes. But there are no, no medications, no doctors, no hospitals, no diagnostic labs. So that's one observation. The second observation is, if you look back 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a uh, million years, we, we lived a pretty normal life. There were, again, no doctors, no hospitals to go to. And we did not experience such problems. Sometime when we were not well, we stopped eating for a couple of days and the problem got cured. Even now, those of you who have a pet, a dog or a cat will kind of notice occasionally that the dog doesn't want to eat anything. He's not feeling well. He just refuses to eat. And after skipping a couple of meals, he feels fine. So these are two observations. When you, when you think about them, you suddenly realize that uh, why can't we live like that? And these group of doctors who, um, and there are about 10 leading doctors in this area. Some of them were co covered in this documentary that was made in 2011. It's called Forks Over Knives. What it means is that instead of using a knife to cut your rib cage for an open heart surgery, if you use your fork properly in choosing the food you eat, you will never need the knife. So that's the whole premise of this thinking that if you eat proper food as the food was intended for us, we probably will never need any medication or any surgery. Now in the same observation, you realize that when you bring that dog or cat to your home and start feeding it the food that you're buying as dog food or cat food or whatever food, yes, you do need to go see a, a, a doctor, a veterinarian for, for your dog and cat. You also sometimes uh, have to take them for some procedures, some diagnostic tests. So these doctors, they, they feel strongly and their conclusion is that all chronic illnesses, now I'm not talking about infectious diseases, I'm not talking about uh, congenital diseases that you may be born with. And today medicine has advanced tremendously. Uh, even uh, a baby which is uh, born four months premature can survive. And you have an accident, auto accident, and you break your rib cage, you're taken into an ICU and you survive. So that, that the medicine has advanced tremendously. But medicine has failed when it comes to lifestyle diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cancer, cholesterol problem, heart attack, and I can keep on going. So one observation that they made, and this is what I'm gonna talk about is that if we change our diet, since all our chronic diseases are due to lifestyle and diet, if we change them, the diseases go away. And that's the main discussion of this evening is how to get rid of chronic diseases. So in that connection, I make an observation that there are five important pillars of health. So I will ask uh, Nishka to play some slides we have side by side. And uh, so Nishka, I think you should put that slide which talks about the 
Uh, outline for today, yeah, okay. You want to split the screen into two or as we had discussed or um, so, 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 yeah, right now you have it. Yeah, okay. So thank you. So in today's discussion, we will talk about uh, the five pillars of health, which are food, detoxification, physical activity, emotional support, and a spiritual balance. So these are the five fundamental uh, pillars that support good health. And among these five, the first two, food and detoxification, they pretty much cover bulk of your health, 80% of your health is due to these two factors. Now, human body is about 30 trillion cells. And each cell kind of has a mind of its own. Each cell is looking for nutrition. And it's looking for nutrition literally every second. When you breathe 15 times a minute and you pump blood 60 times a minute, which is one pump, one pumping action every second, that blood takes to every part of your body, to all the 30 trillion cells, a fresh supply of oxygen and a fresh supply of nutrients, which are in your blood. So your blood vessels cover almost 70,000 mile distance all over your body. Out of these 30 trillion cells, Believe it or not, 25 trillion of those 30 trillion cells are red blood cells. These red blood cells are being pumped every second. Your heartbeat is typically 60 beats per minute, which is one beat per second. So every second, every cell in your body is getting nutrition, getting oxygen and the food it needs, the nutrients it needs. Now at the same time, a cell also needs to excrete, just like human beings need to go to the toilet in the morning or urinate four or five times a day. Similarly, each cell needs to remove the waste material. And that waste material gets collected by our lymphatic system and it's passed on to blood, which then passes it on to, to your urine and uh, through uh, your lungs as carbon dioxide. So we're gonna first talk about the first pillar of health, which is food. Um, so let's, uh, uh, Nishka, we can move to the next slide. Okay, these are the five pillars of health I talked about. And now we're gonna talk about food. In food, we'll discuss four things. There are certain myths floating around, passed on from one generation to another. Some of them are propagated by some vested interest groups. And I'll discuss maybe a few of them, considering the amount of time we have. It's, it's short today. Then we'll talk about what to eat, how to eat, and when to eat. These all make difference. So let's, let's look at some of the myths about food. Nishka? The slide on myths. All right. So one myth we have is eat everything in moderation. I can't. I can't. The problem with that myth is <clears throat> when you eat everything in moderation, you also get disease in moderation. By the time you reach 60, 65, you start taking some blood pressure pills some uh, blood sugar pills, you start suffering some pain in your knees or back pain, some symptoms of arthritis. And so it is a myth, it should not be that way. People, we have observed people who live in certain areas of the world which are known as blue zones, where people live the longest. 
Okinawa in Japan is one of them. And there are several other where people live to be 90 and 100 almost as a norm. And they're active. They're 95, 100 year old, they're still doing farming, putting in six, eight hours every day in their farms, living a healthy, normal life. That's how it was supposed to be. So everything in moderation does not work because when you have everything in moderation, you get disease in moderation, you end up spending the last five years of your life suffering pain and discomfort and making trips to hospital. So that's the first myth. Second myth is protein myth. Protein was discovered about 170 years ago um, in uh, 1839. And when protein was discovered, they real realized that it's a very important nutrient because every cell is made of protein. But just because it's important nutrient doesn't, need, doesn't mean that you need a lot of it. And that's a problem. And the problem is that the, the food industry, which sells meat, dairy, fish, and egg, wants you to think that you need to eat a lot of protein. There are a lot of myths floating around if you go to internet that you need to have 20% of your diet as protein or some go to as much as one third of your diet should be protein. It's a big problem. A child, when a child is born, child weighs about uh, six pounds, seven pounds. And within three months, that child becomes 12 pounds, 14 pounds. So the child doubles his weight in three months. Now you would think that at that fastest growing the stage in life, one would need maximum protein. But you'll be surprised to, to learn that mother's milk, which is the perfect food for a newborn child, has only five to 6% protein. Only five to 6% protein. US government had done research and in, in 1947, they came up with recommendation that your diet should have minimum five to six percent protein during daily consumption. So if you're going to consume 2,000 calories a day, a typical person, then only 100 to 120 calories need to be from protein. Most people in America eat about four times that much, 20 to 25 percent protein. Anything you watch on TV, any box you pick up of any packaged food, the first thing they want to talk about how high they are in protein. 97% of Americans consume too much protein. Now the problem with that is all the, the, our body has no way of storing protein. It can store sugar, some sugar, can be stored in liver, some sugar can be stored in muscles. Any extra sugar gets converted into fat and fat is our way of storing energy for the rainy day. All extra protein we consume, anything above five to 6%, gets converted constantly in our liver into fat and what comes out is nitrogen because protein, protein has nitrogen. It's nitrogen plus hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen is in fat, is in carbohydrate, but nitrogen is not there, so the nitrogen has to be removed. Nitrogen is removed by making ammonia, which is NH3. Ammonia is very toxic. It gets converted into uric acid, and you pee it out as urine. So the more protein you eat, the more your kidneys are taxed because it has to convert all that extra protein into fat. So you might as well just eat more fat than, than, than protein. It's, it's, it's better to, to have um, more fat than, than protein or more carbohydrates than protein. So 
the, the, as a result of this extra working of your liver and kidney, what happens by the time you turn 60, 65, 70, you develop kidney problems and you have to go for dialysis. Dialysis and dialytic centers is the fastest growing industry in America. You go, go to any strip mall, a, a shop, a shopping strip, and you will see there'll be some, some uh, hair cutting salon, some beauty care, nail care, and some yoga center. And there will be some kind of a dialysis center. It's everywhere. So the reason that your kidneys need dialysis in old age is because throughout your life, you consume too much protein. So one should not worry about eating too much protein. In fact, if you want to worry at all, you should worry about not eating enough fiber. 97% of Americans don't eat enough fiber. And that's where the problem lies. Similarly, there is a myth about calcium and milk. There's a myth that for strong bones, we need more calcium and milk provides that calcium. It is a myth because the countries which consume more milk and these countries which consume the largest amount of milk per capita are US, Canada, Denmark, and Sweden. And these four countries have highest rate of osteoporosis. So they are, they are, our bones are weaker in these countries, which results in having, having to replace knee replacement and hip replacement surgery once you reach the age of 70, 75. And that's the main reason. So it is wrong to think that you need milk to get that calcium. The actually milk weakens your bones. Another misconception is we should avoid carbs. Carbs are fattening. Carbs are not fattening. Carbs is what you want to eat. You need energy. Only refined carbs are bad. Sugar and, and donuts and danishes and your soft drinks, they are bad, but they are all refined carbs. You need to eat all carbs in natural form. All fruits are carbs. All vegetables are carbs. All beans are mostly carbs. So carb is what our body needs. Our body needs to eat because I just talked about the fact that we need only five to six percent protein. And uh, so anything under 10 percent, you are fairly healthy. Um, and we need very little fat because our body makes fat very easily. Any extra calories, body just converts it into fat. Fat is like uh, your freezer in your, in your house. In your house, you have a refrigerator and a freezer that you keep in the basement. So the fat cells in our body are like a deep freeze and our liver where we keep stored sugar for the quick access to energy is like a refrigerator. Similarly, the fat myth, there, there's a thinking that uh, saturated fat is bad or uh, this was a, a myth for which, which lasted for 40 years which came uh, as a result of a, a faulty study uh, known as seven country study that was done by Mr. Keyes. So fat in itself is not bad. Fat in natural form, fat you get from avocado, fat you get from uh, nuts and seeds, from garbanzo beans and chickpeas. That fat is very good fat. And you can eat as much as you feel like. It is a refined fat, which is a problem. So, and then another myth is uh, that I can make up for a poor diet by over-exercising, going to gym and working out. And that's a myth again, because diet is about 80% of your health. Exercise and other factors, uh, stress, emotional stress, exercise, all those are just about, can be lumped into 20%. All right, we'll move to the next slide.
So the question is, what should one eat? And we, we believe that one should eat what one ate for 5, 10 million years, food which is available in nature. We call it plant-based and whole food because for millions of years, our ancestors did not have any sophisticated food processing equipment. They could, they could peel it, they could dice it, slice it, smash it, all that is fine. But once you start refining them and converting peanuts into peanut oil, the problem becomes. Our body is more used to eating peanuts and not to eating peanut oils. When you make oil, you remove the fiber. When we eat food, when we eat sugar in a fruit, the sugar is embedded in a fiber. That fiber goes through our digestive system and through our intestines and slowly gets absorbed. When you remove the fiber and eat the sugar, it quickly gets absorbed. When it gets quickly absorbed, your body says, hey, what to do with it? I have no use for it. It just goes to the liver and gets converted into fat. And once it's converted into fat, our body has forgotten how to burn fat. It's, it's, it's looking for, 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 for quick energy. It's kind of an example like you have, you have a refrigerator where you have quick access to food. And then in your basement, you have a big freezer, a deep freeze. When you run short of food, you often are hesitant to go to the deep freeze. Sometimes it is too cold there in the winters. Maybe the area is not warmed up. You are coming back on Sunday night from a party and you say, hey, let's just stop at 7-Eleven and pick up some milk and bread. There's a bread sitting in your free deep freeze, but you don't want to use that. You want to have something fresh. Similarly, our body has become so accustomed to using quickly available energy, which is sitting in liver as sugar. And it doesn't want to go to fat cells and burn the fat. The nature created our body with both storage, a long-term storage and a short-term storage. Short-term storage was in liver and muscles, where we store glycogen as immediately available sugar for energy use. And our deep freezer is our fat cells. Because thousands of years ago, there were periods when we got a lot of food. Then there were periods of famine when we did not have any food. And we used fat cells to access those food. Now we live in a society, we never see famine. There's food available 365 days a year for whole of our life. As a result, our body has forgotten how to, to, to burn fat. So the main uh, focus of this approach to eating and living is that we need to eat food in the whole form. And we need to eat food which is plant-based. No animal food, no eggs, no dairy, and no processing. That's what we want to eat. I want to, uh, Nishka, would you go to the slide about, um, uh, yeah. So this slide shows you that you can eat corn in nine different ways. Corn on the cob, that's the most natural form uh, and the healthiest form. Then you can get frozen corn. You can make soup out of that or add them to your stew or other dishes. Fine, that is almost as good. Not quite, but almost. Third is you have corn meal. So these are all in order of desirability. Um, then you have uh, corn flour and corn starch. Corn flour is used to make corn tortillas for your burritos and tacos. Then corn starch. Then we have popcorn. Popcorn is a little bit more processed. It's processed at higher temperature. Corn flakes is very processed. Now you're doing things to corn. You're mixing other things, mixing some preservatives, taking out some of the fiber. So you're doing more and more processing. 
So after corn flakes, after corn, uh, popcorn, the food has become now unhealthy. Corn oil is very unhealthy. And the last in this list is high fructose corn syrup, which is the sugar made out of corn. And that sugar is used in 80% of the processed food that you buy from a grocery store. That sugar is used in all soft drinks because pure sugar is too expensive. In US, we grow a lot of corn. Corn is also subsidized. Corn farmers are subsidized. And, uh, and corn is also genetically modified. So high fructose corn syrup. So that is the, where your problem lies. You start eating corn oil, corn flakes, and high fructose corn syrup, your health goes down the hill. So one needs to make a change. Similarly, in every food item, whether it is wheat or oatmeal, if you're going to have oatmeal, have old-fashioned oat, not uh, processed oat or one-minute oat. Um, oatmeal is a very healthy breakfast. OK, we go back to Nishka, please, the previous slide. Previous one before, OK. The second thing important is in uh, what to eat is we should eat about 1% of our body weight. So if you weigh about 150 pounds, you should eat about one and a half pounds of fruits every day and another one and a half pounds of vegetables every day. It's very important. That is how you get food in its natural form. So most of the fruits you'll be eating raw, most of the vegetables, uh, except for starchy vegetables, but green leafy vegetables, tomatoes, uh, beetroot, uh, cucumber, all those healthy foods, uh, try to eat them as much possible as raw. So let's we'll go to the next slide. Here is a, here's a typical daily uh, a meal plan in America. You get up 7 o'clock in the morning, have coffee with maybe milk and sugar. 9 o'clock, you get some breakfast, uh, eggs, bagel, toast. Um, now then you have a lunch between 12 and 1. Your lunch is... Uh, two slices of bread uh, with some uh, cold cut meat, some ham or, or bologna or salami or, or whatever, or, or, or tuna salad or chicken salad or some pasta. At 4.30, you, you have some, I think I meant the soda, it's not soup, unlikely. But anyway, you, you take some snacks, you better go get some chips and a and a soft drink or, or lemonade or something like that. Eight o'clock, you come back, have your dinner, whether it's a burger or pizza or pasta, some kind of food like that, uh, meat and, uh, and, and bread. And then, okay, I think that the timing got a little offset. The meat loaf and other dinner is around eight o'clock. And then you take some late night snack before going to bed so at 9.30, 10 o'clock, maybe a glass of milk or uh, uh, another glass of orange juice. So what happens when you analyze this meal, most of the dishes here have no fiber because meat has no fiber, fish has no fiber, eggs have no fiber, dairy has no fiber. And they all are rich in protein. As a result, you're consuming too much protein and too little fiber. And that's where the problem lies in, in, in American, uh, typical American uh, meal and lifestyle. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, we did that. Let's move forward. OK. So, so let's look at. Um, nutrients we need, the previous one, previous slide, nutrients we need. We need nutrients which are uh, macro and micronutrients. Macronutrients are, are your uh, uh, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. 
and we all are getting them. I, we, I discussed that, that we get too much protein and too much fat and not enough carbohydrate, not enough fiber. On micro, we often miss out on fiber, which is a very important micronutrient. We miss out on phytochemicals and antioxidants because we are eating mostly cooked meal and when you cook meal, phytochemicals, antioxidants, flavonoids, they get killed. So, or they get reduced substantially to less than half. So that's the problem in our diet is that we're eating a lot of processed and cooked diet. Let's move on further. Mishka, all right. In terms of uh, how to eat, it is important here, when, what I mean by drink your food is that you need to chew your food in such a way that when you swallow your food, it is almost liquid. So remember a single line, if you can remember, that you want to eat your water and drink your food. Now, most of fruits and vegetables are 80 to 90% water. Let's go to the next slide. Drink, this is what I mean by eating your water. You eat grapefruits, eat tomatoes, apples, cucumbers, kiwi. They all are 90 to 95% water. So except for the morning water, when you start your day, if you would have a couple of glasses of warm water, the rest of the day, as much as possible, whenever you are thirsty, reach out for, a, for an apple or a pear or some strawberries. And that would be a very good change in habit if you can do that. Uh, a lot of people ask me, how can you eat one and a half pound of fruits and one and a half pound of vegetables? So one of the ways to eat green leafy vegetables is to do green juicing. If you start doing, this is a, a recipe for juices here. This juice recipe was uh, shared in a documentary, which I recommend called Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead. It has kale and, and green apple, uh, Granny Smith apple, kale, cucumber, ginger and lemon. And, and if you can develop a habit of having two glasses of this juice, just in two glasses, you're getting about a pound and a half of fruits and vegetables. So, so the, the just two glasses of juice takes care of one and a half pound of fruits and vegetables. That just leaves another one and a half pound to eat. You eat some salad, some soup, and fresh fruits, and you're done with it. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, now we, we will talk about when to eat. So most people think what difference does it make whether you eat it in the morning or afternoon or evening. And, and uh, believe me, there's enough research that shows that it makes a big difference. The 2016 Nobel Prize was given on this subject to, to Dr. Yoshinori and also 2018 Nobel Prize to Dr. Honzo who did research on on cancer therapy and how to build our immune system to fight cancer. He also talks about the timing is very important. What this, what this uh, slide shows is that most people have a 15 hour eating window. By that, it means that they probably start eating at seven in the morning and then they eat, continue eating something or other every two, three hours, and the last meal is at 10 at night. So only from 10 at night to seven in the morning, only for those nine hours, their stomach is getting any rest. For 15 hours, they're eating. This is very unhealthy, very unhealthy. And we need to reduce this window to as little as eight hours. You see, um, and, 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 and that concept is called intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding. You see, two, millions of years ago, there was no food available in a refrigerator or in your kitchen. 
when we got up in the morning we had to go hunt for food or ladies and children went to gather fruits and berries men went either for hunting or more for uh, scavenging and, and looking for some uh, meat or small chicken or a rabbit or something like that they probably came back home by 10:30 11 and cooked their meal so the first meal they most likely had was around 11 o'clock and then before the sunset or by the sunset before it got dark they finish everything in fact there was not even a fire available for 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 many millions of years of our evolution we only got fire two million years ago so if we would live that life where we would start our breakfast late and finish our dinner early our health improves substantially it does wonders so let's move to the next slide okay uh, so i said earlier that each of our 30 trillion cell needs nutrition and we talked about what to eat when to eat now let's talk about detoxification and so I recommended that we take two glasses of water in the morning. First thing. Another thing important for detoxification is that all the, all the excretion of waste by each cell is accumulated into our, into our um, um, lymphatic glands lymphatic system we have a lymphatic system in our body that collects waste from all over the body and 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 it passes it on uh to the blood for cleaning and to for urination purposes so unlike the blood system which has a pump which is your heart your lymphatic system does not have a pump it moves when your body moves so we have lymphatic nodes in our underarms and in our thighs or under thighs. So walking is very important. Our body was designed for walking. We should be walking every hour for at least five minutes every hour, every waking hour. So if you are awake for 17 hours and you do five minutes of walking every hour, that's about 85 minutes of walking or that's about 10,000 steps a day. So the easiest way to monitor your lifestyle is get some kind of a step counter and make sure that you finish your 10,000 steps every day. There are other ways of doing detoxification. Yoga is a good way. Um, also, there's a breathing exercises. Uh, they're known as pranayam. Uh, yoga, pranayam, both are good detoxification techniques. And then meditation and prayer are detoxification of our mind and intellect. So every day we should develop a routine whereby we are following detoxification and helping our body detoxify. Uh, in detoxification, two things are very important. So I'll come to those now. One is intermittent fasting. Next slide. Yeah, in intermittent fasting, you reduce your eating window to preferably eight hours, and then definitely not more than 12 hours, uh, as little as eight hours. And uh, so you can make a routine of uh, 10, you start your breakfast or first caloric meal at 10 o'clock. You can have uh, coffee without cream and sugar early if you have uh, light coffee or have coffee addiction but any caloric meal should start at 10 and finish your dinner by six. That's eight hours. And, and that's good, very healthy practice. Or you can start at 11, finish by seven. You can even shoot for those who are overachievers can shoot for less than uh, eight hours. There are, uh, I do uh, eight, a six hour eating window. I start my meal and I combine lunch and breakfast into brunch. So I take my brunch at noon and I try to finish my dinner by six o'clock and I don't eat anything after six in the evening till noon following morning. Uh, 
it's a good idea to do exercises while you are in the fasting window. So do your walking in the morning while you have not consumed any food or walking after dinner. Give a, give a gap of about half an hour, 45 minutes. And if you can do a little bit of walking after dinner, they both are very good practices. The practices that I'm talking here are good for everyone from teenager onwards, but especially for old people who are currently suffering from diseases. If you follow these guidelines, you will find that within three months, two months, your, your blood chemistry is improving, your blood pressure is going down, your blood sugar has gone down, your cholesterol has gone down, and you'll find that you no longer need those medications. Of course, in consultation with your doctor, you can drop those medications. I, I have about 3,500 people in various health groups on WhatsApp and Facebook, and practically all of them who were on medication by third month to start giving up their medication in consultation with their doctor. So I have here a scoring system of if you add all the hours you have fasted during one week and all the total number of miles or equivalent to miles you have walked, you come up with a score. And there's a grade over 140 score is excellent Grade A, grade B is between 120 and 140. Grade C is between 100 and 120. Once your grade is less D or, or F, your health begins to fail. You start aging faster than the chronological age. Every year, instead of aging 12 months, you start aging 14, 15, 16 months. And as a result, by the time you are 70, 75, you find yourself consuming seven, eight different drugs and a frequent visit to doctors. In your 80s, now you're making visits to urgent care and things like that. It doesn't have to be that way. You should be able to live 100 years of your life without ever having to go to see a hospital or, 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 or taking any medications. Let's move to the next slide. So in, in, in intermittent fasting, one thing I forgot to tell you is that Dr. Yoshinori, who got the Nobel Prize for 2016, discovered that intermittent fasting helps us clean up the cells, detoxify the cells. All the, the damaged cells, the damaged protein, which is sitting in a, like a trash can in every cell, gets recycled and used up again. So it has a tremendous rejuvenating effect. Similarly, in 2018, Dr. Honzo found out that if we do a prolonged fast, a fast for about 10 days every year, once a year a 10-day fast, or twice a year a five-day fast, our body develops immunity, immunity to cancer. Our body gets rid of dead cells or cells which were sitting inactive and, and damaged. They are cleaned up and, and the body becomes, develops a, a tremendous immune system. So I'm just making a passing reference to that. Those who are interested can always Google 2016 Nobel Prize, 2018 Nobel Prize, and you will see these things. Nobel Prize in Physiology. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about uh, chronic disease. A, a, a chronic disease, let's go to that S curve, previous chart. Yeah. So our body has a tremendous capability to compensate for misuse of body in terms of diet and lifestyle. In this S curve, the middle portion is a straight line going up and down diagonally. And if you visualize that your perfect health is in the middle of this S curve, <clears throat> you're moving up and down easily in your young age. So yes, you, you, you put it through some, uh, some stress. You had a party Saturday night and consumed some unhealthy food and, and uh, alcohol or whatever. But the next day, it, it came back, it slides down. So it has a tremendous capability of moving up and down. 
and compensating for your wrong actions, for, it, for improper food, for your constant eating. But then once it reaches a point where it is no longer able to compensate, okay? So like for blood sugar, your blood sugar normally should be around between 80 and 100. And if you are eating more frequently from the morning, seven o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, you're, you are getting a lot of, lot of sugar in your, in your food. Your body releases insulin and that insulin helps put that sugar back into your muscles or your liver converts it. So insulin masks the, the abuse of your body. But then it reaches a point where your body becomes resistant to insulin and insulin is not able to do the job. By the time you're 40, 45, you develop insulin resistance and, 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 and your, your blood sugar begins to go up. And now you're reaching the top end. So that is where you begin to notice the disease. The same thing happens with your blood pressure. Your body is developing in your blood vessels. You're developing certain atherosclerosis, certain deposits of cholesterol because we eat inflammatory food. That inflammatory food comes um, in the form of animal protein and, and animal fat and it creates scars our internal lining of our blood vessels and and cholesterol heals those scars okay it reduces the effective opening of your blood vessel your pressure blood pressure goes up your body keeps pumping same amount of blood but it needs more pressure to pump the blood because the vessels have become narrow so that the curved portion is showing how body is compensating and when you reaches the top, your body begins to break down and your systems fail. Your kidney fails, your liver fails, your cardiac arrest happens. All these problems then come. So if you can catch your, your poor diet and lifestyle early and change it, you will find that you can slide down to the healthy range very quickly. And I'm talking like in weeks. If you start doing just a simple thing as green juicing, you need to flood your body with nutrients and, and remove the toxins. So green juice is an easy way. It is not necessarily the best way. The best way is to, to consume five green leafy vegetable servings per day. That's what doctor, doctor the, the heart specialist, Dr. Um, Caldwell Esselstyn, who treats Bill Clinton, and uh, who was in the documentary, Folks Over Knives, he talks about, he asked all his patients, including Bill Clinton, to eat five servings of green leafy vegetables every two hours. All right, let's move to the last slide. So the cancer, I, I just want to talk a little bit about cancer as to why cancer happens. A lot of people like to blame cancer onto environment that we live in this environment. That is partly true. What happens is we all, 19, roughly 99% of the modern society population has tiny cancer cells in our body. They're floating around. You can't escape it. We all face it. But we all don't develop tumor. So cancer becomes a tumor because those cells stop somewhere in your liver, in your colon, in your breast, and develop roots. They form blood vessels. Once they form blood vessels, now that cancer cell is receiving nutrition. Every second, I talked about it, that every second your heart pumps blood and that blood goes to every cell. So that cancer cell, which may have been floating around in your body for eight, nine years, if it is, sticks to its place and forms a root, that process is called angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means formation of new blood vessels. It's like forming root. You take a seed, you give it some water under soil, and a root is formed. Similarly, a cancer cell, when it is attached to a part of your body and it forms roots, now, it is getting 
nutrition every second. And it builds and grows. And a tumor becomes now uh, noticeable. And, and we say that the person is suffering from cancer or that lady has got a breast cancer lump. Breast cancer did not happen overnight or within a year. It takes many years for that cancer to develop. So cancer is caused by mutation of our genes. Mutation of genes can happen either due to exposure to radiation or some other microwave radiation and things like that. That's one reason, OK? Uh, so yes, if you are um, uh, exposed to a nuclear bomb uh, explosion, even you were visiting a test site, as people were doing in 1941, 42, 43, uh, you are more likely to develop cancer because certain genes in your body have mutated. And now that they have mutated, they're going to reproduce their revised form of uh, genes, which is cancer cells. <clears throat> but there's another factor that causes cancer, and most people don't know about it. There's a, there's a, there's a doctor, there's a scientist in Berkeley Labs who has demonstrated and highly respected that he has shown that when our body is deficient in micronutrients, in vitamins, in, in trace minerals, then the body has tends to allocate those micronutrients to more important organs first, to heart, to lungs, to kidney. As a result, some other parts which the body perceives to be less important, like your nails are not so critical, your hair, your skin, uh, certain uh, such items are not mission critical for, fun for your survival. Body gives them less micronutrients so that it can give more to the important organs. So deficiency in micronutrients leads to mutation, which also causes cancer. So these are the two different causes of cancer. The first one, most people know, but the second one, very few people know or pay attention to. So once the cancer has been initiated, then the second thing is progression of cancer and the progression of cancer happens because we eat foods which cause angiogenesis. I just talked about that, which is helping build new blood vessels. Food that causes angiogenesis, or the food is called angiogenetic food, is your meats, dairy, egg, fish, all animal foods are angiogenetic. All refined foods, refined sugar, refined oil, they are also angiogenetic foods. Okay. So for, 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 uh, for cancer patients, it's important that they eat foods which are anti-angiogenic, okay? And which is same food I talked about, plant-based whole food. And, and I also talked about the, how fasting can help. So immunotherapy was um, the, the, the focus of 2018 Nobel Prize, which in which Dr. Honzo showed that when our body goes through stress of not getting any protein for extended periods of time, four, five days, 10 days, it, it, it develops a certain immunity. And uh, your cancer cells are also denied that protein. And it's a way of treating cancer cells. There's a doctor, Dr. Longo, Walter Longo in uh, USC, he has created a diet called fast mimicking diet because many Americans find it difficult to fast more than an hour, more than a day. And, and so he has a diet which helps create, mimic the same body response as would happen if you were to fast for five to 10 days. And that diet is very helpful. It is helping a lot of patients who are going through chemotherapy. Uh, if, if there's anybody in this audience who is going through a cancer treatment or who has a family member or friend going through cancer treatment, you should look into that. Uh, Google the word um, fast mimicking diet and, and you will get that. So I think with that, we complete our
discussion. So in a net net, what uh, I recommend to all my uh, members on my health group to follow a diet which is plant-based whole food, uh, minimizing the processed food and refined food, um, and uh, do some intermittent fasting, which means a uh, narrow eating window of eight hours, and do 10,000 steps of activity. So that's what basic theme is. I, um, I have given, I have formed a new WhatsApp health group um, with the, uh, which I have given to Jade and Nishka. And I also have a health group on Facebook uh, called number two, make my health. Two is a number and then make my health. So if anybody is interested, they can uh, reach out to me and we discuss such subjects. It takes us about um, two to three months to cover the full subject matter. And most people within this two to three month time frame start feeling better and getting rid of medications. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lily. I put the chat, the link to the WhatsApp group. I know your next session will start in sometime in October, so coming up. Um, and I want to um, be mindful of the time. I know we're going a little over an hour. If anyone is um, joining, thinking of planning on joining the next session, I put the link to the Zoom. Um, I don't think we have time for Q&A, but I did, you know, um, they are open to asking questions in the WhatsApp group, right, sure. Lily? <coughs> yeah, they can ask yeah. questions okay. in the health group. I, I also recommend everybody to yeah. watch that documentary, Forks Over Knives. Mm -hmm. It has actually uh, yes, forks and I wanted over to, knives. Yeah, yeah, make that uh, yeah. re re remind you of a cooking session at the same time tomorrow, which is inspired by a lot of these conversations around plant-based diets and the documentary Forks Over Knives. Um, our chef tomorrow got a lot of inspiration from Lilith, so... I'm looking forward to that. Um, and again, if you are new to Kids in Art, um, check us out on our website, kidsinart.org. Feel free to donate um, at the button down below. You can also um, donate by texting AHI2020 to 43725. <laughs> um, okay, um, I think we're gonna log off now. And thanks so much for joining. Thank you, bye-bye.